ready. All right. Check, check. Sound good? All right. Everyone, hey, my name is Spencer French. I know you're probably wondering what happened to the like, incredible, remarkable person who typically hosts this? Well, Pam is sitting right here. Poetic Melody is going to be uh, uh, participating today as a get a little bit of a break. So try not to act too disappointed. Uh, <laughs> but welcome to Poetry Den. If you're new here, this is a place where people from the community get together, we share poems, we dream together, we think about what it could look like to join radical community. We work to hear each other's stories, to share each other's stories, to find the words that we're looking for. Uh, Audre Lorde talks about how there is this overwhelming power towards silence that oppressive systems bring. And so putting experiences to language is an inherently liberative thing, especially if you're coming from an oppressed identity. And that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to, to create a space where we hear those stories and really listen to them. So um, the structure of this is gonna be pretty simple. We have a uh, sign up sheet, which I will go grab. And people will sign up for poets. You'll be called up. You have five to seven minutes to read any poems that you like. Um, and then we'll go to another person from the sign up sheet. And then we will welcome our wonderful feature poet, Lulu, um, as well. If anyone on uh, the Zoom would like to read as well, you can drop a little note in the comment section. And we will have George keep a, a deft eye out for that. Uh, other than that, we'll uh, I'll get started with a couple poems. I'll start uh, since I'm in like I'm the one with the mic right now. It seems only appropriate. And I've allotted myself. Uh, I told Pam earlier I have a 45 minute uh, interpretive poetic belly dance routine that I've been really trying to hone. I figured we'd just start off with that right away. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I've been waiting to say that joke all day, guys. All like all day. <laughs> So uh, I have a couple of love poems for you guys. Uh, spring's in the air and it seems only appropriate to read some things. Uh, so this is just, uh, I'm gonna go right into this. This is called The Graveyard. It was midnight in Midtown when you and I decided to drive past the city center's relentless light, past manufactured cul-de-sac happiness, past an uninterrupted string of green into the freed night the beautiful black of the countryside. I parked in the back street of a cornfield graveyard. The stars resurrected from the city's bronze haze and made of themselves an audience. Dancing into the backseat, lips meet, time stills, intertwined, I do not mind. Fill each other, be filled. Sweet cherry wine press closer. Closer, eyes close, faith needs no sight, be thorough, boy. Closer, faster, go slow, yes, bodies tangles, yes, heartbeats meet. Breathe, breathe. My dear, how did you cast this spell on me? The car air is now only exhale. We ease the door open and our aura follows. Fog diffuses the night. Even the moon was blurred, I remember. We sway among the moss-swallowed stones. I look into your dark eyes, which are beautiful in ways the city light could never contrive funny. It was in a graveyard we first came alive. Thank you. So for the people who are, just came in, if anyone wants to read, there's a sign-up sheet right there. Daryl, can you kind of wave that around? Um, and I'm gonna read one more poem, if people can sign up, and then I'll grab that sheet and start calling people out to come and read themselves. Sound good? All right. This next poem is uh, called My Favorite Part. And just a little backstory behind this. Uh, in the history of like, so I, I am a, a student, I study poetry and resistance movements and religion. And you can't study too much poetry without getting into love poems. And one of the big problems of love poems is it often takes the object of your affections and turns that person into an object, right? The other person's voice doesn't get to speak. You sit there praising someone like they're a statue, but they don't have any agency in the poem. And that's a real problem. Um, and so this is a poem among many, many other things that is trying to wrestle with that process and see what you can do in the midst of that to create a more dialogical, more communal poetry. My favorite part. My favorite part was not the passion, 
Elation at a gesture, despair your elsewhere gaze. Not the performance of romance, cherry wine, candlelight, always some manner of severed flowers. It wasn't the convenience of a date on retainer for weddings, an answer for the questions every Thanksgiving. It wasn't even, this is the greatest concession, the ecstasy of sex. No, my favorite part was the way you drank water. A big swig, followed by swall swallows, each of which swished. It was your super glued glasses, your instinctual fear of spiders, your sheer unforced awe every time you saw a deer. I do not mean to convey disinterested study, nor observation. Even the word appreciation goes awry, for each implies a degree of distance, and you were always too near to be reduced to an exhibit at an art museum or a muse on some far mountain. No, I'm talking about allergies to cats, peanuts, bananas, and the subsequent learned scrutiny of friends, pets, and ingredient labels. This is about box braids, promptos, 4C hair, and cocoa butter, and all the other details which I was not and now am aware. This is about the afternoon your skin shone sorrel in the sunset saffron and yet was a deep, somehow, a deeper brown how. And here I pause to leave unsaid all those things I noticed on the rare occasion we shared my bed, which is not to parade our pleasures, though I could, but is rather to note the cute thing that would sometimes happen to you before sealing it away for us alone behind the door of this poem. My favorite part was the slow, prolonged noticing. And it's reciprocation, like that time you asked me unprompted to offer my thoughts on meter because you had spent a couple of your spare hours researching verse and now wanted my opinion. Damn, that was hot. I'm sorry. <laughs> to love a person and not the idea of a person is to love idiosyncrasies, is to opt against your dearly held hypotheticals, preferring instead the unsung wonder of stretch marks and sweat smells. Even now, I can think of nothing more beautiful than the scintillating tip of your left front tooth, inordinately white on account of the filling you as a child required after flying smile first over the handlebars of your bike. <laughs> it is miscolored and so bright. To love is, to know is, to come near enough to notice. And my dear, I have noticed. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. So let's get this started off. Uh, I'll go the first name on the list. Ted Wycamp. Would you like to come forward? All right. Stage is all yours. <laughs> this is in person this time, yes. I enjoy the opportunity to share this time with you, whether it's through Zoom or here, because it affords me an opportunity to learn something. And if I can just get one new fiber of knowledge each time I come, just think of the growth that that, that can spur. And hopefully through my words, maybe you'll find a nugget, I hope. The first is pursuit of truth. Now, the truth is, if I want to read this, okay. First truth. Yeah. Um, oh! <laughs> uh, I have long been in the search for truth. It began before I understood in my youth. For mankind, the search began with Adam and Eve. After Luther told an untruth, he made them believe. Since then, the trek to explain the truth has baffled all who played sleuth. Religious philosophers, mathematicians without subsidence charge you to follow what they preach as proper guidance. Philosophers won't tell you what is true, only guidelines what truth should do. It should be intuitive, understandable, and pragmatic. 
Yet it is easy to argue these standards are erratic. Religious leaders claim they are empowered to decide what is true. And then it is a sin if it by you don't abide. They look to scripture to tell you what truth should be. However, even among themselves, they often you know, disagree. Mathematicians created value set truth tables, believing numbers could find truths and provide labels. Yet not all propositions can be tested or held up to account to determine truth exists as claimed by a numerical amount. Webster thought truth reflects beliefs held on common ground. Of course, then the world thought the world people thought the world was truly flat and until it was round. Unsure what makes a truth is in fact, is it beliefs or both? I do not know it has been proven we can't even believe one's oath. After thinking about this, I'm going to be so bold. I am certain what is true is not always what we've been told. Wow. Yes, all, right, thank you. all right, class, a little more lessons now. This is based on Buddha's teaching. <laughs> And this is about, whoops, I'm getting shorter and shorter and shorter. <laughs> uh, my arms are getting longer. Uh, we'll have to pull this up. There we go. All right. Oh, hey, yeah, now we're getting in business. Yeah. My, my arms are longer, but my eyes are shorter. I don't know. <laughs> when in school, I always got a note. You know, he's very talkative. And I, I should have read this. I should have read this. This is based on Buddhist thoughts about silence. Silence, a weapon, a tool, a gift that empowers self-rule. Silence is not an empty space. It is filled with thought to embrace. Like the thunder of a storm's cloud, silence power is also deafeningly loud. At times, it is the best reply to attacks. There is no need to deny. A fool is known by his speech, his noise, a wise man, the silent wisdom he employs. Do not speak your thoughts just to be heard, unless the stillness is improved by your word. Thoughts built in silence when held back, enemies have no knowledge of what to attack. If someone doesn't value what you say, then silence is the best answer to their play. Be silent if your words are not understood. Be silent if without words you are understood. In silence, thoughts are not treated as rubble. Being voiceless, you will avoid trouble. In confusion, do not expect to find God to contribute or try to bribe him with promise of tribute. Do not interrogate silence. Silence is mute. It is from within your thoughts will bear fruit. Unify your mind with silence, meditation. It will create awareness, concentration. Enter into a world of rapture, pleasure, freeing hidden thoughts, life's treasure. If someone doesn't understand your silence, they probably will not understand your words. Thank you. One very brief one regarding the ecology, because that's so much on the minds of all of us these days. Wind, our father's breath. Earth, our mother's fertile womb. Water, our life's blood. Together they nourish us. Without thought, we destroy them. Thank you. Can we give one more round of applause? For Ted Rogers? <laughs> Thanks, Ted. One of the things I love so much about Poetry Den is I can get up here and talk about how like one of the, the we need to like avoid silence and put things to word because in, in the fight for liberation, it always comes, 
like the, the systems of domination want to take people of their voices. And then tech can come up here and share another truth that is true at the same time, which is that silence is a sacred gift and the things that you hold inside of yourself is a sacred thing as well. So thank you for that. I, I got my nugget already. I appreciate that. So, all right. So next I'm going to invite Valerie. Uh, all right. Hello, everyone. Sister Lulu and Johnny. Yeah, my name is Valerie, and um, I am going to reread a poem that I've done here before, but it's based on my exper experience as an immigrant from Zimbabwe, and as there is a fellow Zimbabwean in the house, yeah. I saw it fitting. So some of you had heard this already, some of you haven't. I hope you enjoy nonetheless. And um, it's called Dimba Zimbabwe, which is just the elongated version of the name of my country, Zimbabwe, which means Great House of Rock. Wow. Okay. But, Mama, how will they know I came from rock? From Pangea's outburst that stood up to tsunami waves, granddaughter of magma, conceived in tectonic shifts. If you break me off your back, I become a pebble lost at sea, and how will they know I came from rock? The waves, they laugh at me, pummel me back and forth till my sharp, strong jigsaw edges, edges molded to fit flush in the concavity I left in your side, the edges that shaped me in the story of my home are beaten and battered off me till I am smooth and undefined. Your edges are dangerous, the waves said. They will cut our fish. And so I stumble forward, afraid and ashamed that you'd barely recognize me. How will my smooth, rounded form ever fit back in your jagged side? Do you know I came from rock? from the altar that the morning light prays to as he splits the sea and the skies. A fortress, a resting place for time and age. I too would be ruler and power and infinite, unafraid of your rising tide if I had a piece of earth to sink into. But the rock stares at the pebble in envy. Oh, what I would give to be so free, she says, to lean into the ebb and flow and travel to a thousand horizons, crashing on shores like the waves do. Mm. On and on goes the debate between humility and sacrifice, for the rock has lost parts of herself that the pebble might find life. But am I destined to limp in gratitude, find my future in the aimlessness and call it freedom? knowing that the children I will one day break off my own back will be just but grains of sand strewn across foreign beaches in ignorance, never truly knowing the history and reason and beauty in their coarseness, wearing their own gentle jagged edges in ways I never had the courage to. Each gentle jagged edge, a whisper from my mother and living her dream, yet sadly unaware that they too came from rock. Wow. Thank you. And um, the second one is a recent poem that only a couple of you have heard. And um, can all the ladies in the house say hey? hey? Okay, I'm going to need your support for this poem. Hey. So this poem. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, she was part of the, the conception. But uh, this poem is basically, okay, the background is I was eating popcorn one night. And you know when you eat popcorn and you have that little kernel stuck in your teeth? And you're trying to like use your tongue, you're like, and it just will not come out. And then I was like, but what if the popcorn kernel is just happy? Just chilling there. And the tongue is just, it just keeps coming for this poor little popcorn kernel which brought back the memory of me being, you know, a young, hot little thing back in the day. And, um, you know, just minding my business. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but minding my business, especially back home in Zimbabwe and in South Africa, where I lived later. And there was always just a guy who felt the need, as I was minding my own business, to come and try to holler, as TLC would call him, a scrub. You know? And so I realized that the tongue in this case is a scrub and the popcorn kernel is me just minding my business. <laughs> so um, back home, the way they like to holler at you is they say my sister, you know, sister, sister. 
So basically this poem is called My Sister. Okay. okay. <clears throat> eh, I'm sorry, excuse me. My sister, I just glanced over and saw you chilling between the two upper left molars. How about you roll with a high roller and who could roll higher than me? I am Mr. Tongue, but the streets call me Tongue Twister because I'm smooth. I have all sorts of moves for you, my sister. So let me squeeze in, ease in, and maybe get your Insta. Oh, are we playing hard to get? Baby, there's no need to act upset. Give me some time. You'll be glad we met. <laughs> is it just me or is it the closer I get, the deeper you sink between those teeth? Do I scare you? I promise I'm actually quite tasteful. Give me a chance. I promise I'll be faithful. There's no other popcorn kernel in this mouth for me. <laughs> You're a whole snack, my own treat, a whole meal with zero calories, my beauty, my crispy salted queen. Please stop running from me. So you're refusing to come out. You dare reject me? You really think your stubbornness affects me? My sister. <laughs> Mr. Tongue, the original tongue twister. I have tasted food more complex and high end. In fact, I got with champagne and oysters just last weekend. So you should feel lucky that I chose to spend so much time with the likes of you. Or did you have something better to do? Still, you won't come out. Did you know I can shape three languages in this mouth? How is it that I can pronounce words like Shushina and Mangnuchu yet struggle to contort in a way that would suit you? You kernels are all the same. <laughs> you say you want a nice guy, but you're just playing games. Well, fine. Go ahead, but wait and see, because Mr. Fingernail is way worse than me. <laughs> Yes, for now, I'll be alone, wandering these streets, tracing these teeth till I... But who is that looking so fine by the canine? <laughs> uh, Pamsoroi, excuse me, but spinach, you're so divine. <laughs> Come here and let me make you mine. My name is Mr. Tongue, but the streets call me Tongue Twister, and I just can't resist you. My sister! Thank you. Can we give another round of applause? Yeah. Two notes before I go on, uh, that the pebble might find life. Your first poem, beautiful, beautiful line. And uh, I will say, I will confess that popcorn is my favorite snack. I eat it almost every day. And now my experience of that is going to be very confused. <laughs> and thank you for that. I'm gonna be like, uh, uh, do I, how do I, is, is Mr. Floss okay? Uh, uh, so anyways, <laughs> thank you so much. We're gonna, turn on to the Zoom, if that's all right. George, does that work? Is Lori ready? And then we can do Katie after that. Does that work? All right. So take it away, Lori. Hi, thank you. Hey, Lori. Hi. I was afraid I'd have to follow Valerie. Those were awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I love all the poetry so far, it's amazing. So thank you for letting me speak. The first one is called Songbirds. I just wrote this. And did you know that songbirds fly at night? Oh. I did not know that either. They fly at night to um, because of uh, predators. So they don't get, they don't turn into a Scooby snack. So <laughs> this one's called Songbirds. Flying back north in springtime by the light of the moonrise counting on stars to guide them home in the safety of the night 
and that is Songbirds. The second one is called Gardening on a Sunday Afternoon in May. I've read this one before, but it's gardening season, so. Taking breaks between pruning the mean weeds out of the memory garden. You know, the prickly ones that prick your fingers when you touch them. So I grab gloves and yank the hell out of the pricks in my yard for good. <laughs> and I guess I have one more and or two more. This one is called Loud McClouds Evicted from the Motherland. This one, um, my uh, maiden name is Caskey and it was called Mick Caskey, so it's Scottish. So I'll read the poem. My ancestors supposedly were booted out of the serenity of Scotland for manufacturing bad whiskey. What? <laughs> Making bad whiskey. No, I <laughs> That may be why I don't like whiskey. I can only envision my loud, obnoxious ancestors sporting those yellow, awful tartans, running to the ship before they were killed by the masses, leaving the Mick and Mick Caskey behind on the shoreline in the Highlands. <laughs> I'm sure there are some McCaskey, uh, McLeod ancestors uh, turning over in their graves right now, but that's okay. <laughs> this one is from my book, Home. This came out this year. Thank you, it was on March 2nd. And this one, I have not read out loud before. So this is a treat. And they're basically lyrics, but I haven't had the courage to put them to music yet. But I saw on the weather one time, there was a term called derecho, means intense winds. So this is what it's called derecho. Nature had a case of the Mondays. The air was thick, the air was hazy. A storm was brewing, no time to be lazy. Headed back west, escaped nature's Monday. It was derecho. It was no bueno. It was no bueno because of derecho. It was derecho. It was no bueno. It was no bueno because of derecho. Drove home fast, lines of clouds, storm threats chased me out. On the highway, out of the country, storm threats approaching loudly. It was derecho. It was no bueno. It was no bueno because of derecho. It was derecho. It was no bueno. It was no bueno because of derecho. I made it home barely in time. I looked up and saw the lines. The rain hit hard while the wind whined, grateful for home barely in time. The rain hit hard while the wind whined, grateful for home barely in time. And that's great job. Thank you. I'm gonna let other people read now, but um, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thanks, Lori. Thanks, Lori. Can we give one more round of applause for Laura? Yeah. Thanks so much. And congrats on the book. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, are we good to go for Katie next? Keep it on the Zoom train? Is that all right? We can go to someone else if we want to. Uh, Katie, can you hear us? Katie, can you hear us? Katie, can you hear us? Wait for it. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. We can. Hi. Hi. Hey, Katie. Hey, everybody. Hey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Is that Ariane? Yeah. Uh, hey. Hey. Um, yeah, I, I was taking a nap. I just got back from a trip, and so I jumped on the call. Um, so I have been feeling kind of restless. I love to travel. Um, and I've been traveling a lot and as much as I can, maybe in the last four years. Um, and I haven't 
been on a trip since October. I know it's just so far from, you know, my last trip. Um, but I know it's not really. Um, but I, so I've been thinking about traveling and I've been thinking about um, booking trips and I finally have some trips on the books, which helps a lot. Um, but I have some poems here from some of my previous trips kind of inspired by my times uh, traveling. So here I go. Cavernous bird calls fill this forest. Cause of crows, the swallows, chirps and gurgles. The mountain swallows the sound before I can name a thing. Like Adam, I want to worship the rabbit, his translucent ears mesmerizing me by the river where the raspberry grows wild, plump and fervent. Another gift from the birds, another echo of their song, reverberating ripples, waving and shaking through wet skies. Mm. That's that one. <laughs> Thank you. It's weird not being able to see you guys. It's kind of awful. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, here's another one. The atmosphere here beckons me to come home. This flowering country road, that gray blue misty morning tide, every towering redwood and those far off foggy peaks. Each holds my face and hands made of moss, sand dollars, driftwood, echo full echoes and says this, this right here is your home. And that's that one. And then a couple short ones. Barefoot to the bathhouse is exactly how I want to remember this trip. My eyes, my feet on Maine, ferns and spongy forest earth, soil sticking in the grooves of my toe prints. That's that one. Arcadia Dune, Lake Michigan Blue, burns like you do in my mind fire. Flame watching, fire tunnel running, the way we met, fraught. Flight and fight, arms waving wildly into the sun, skidding down sand, dune rolling. Crystal, crystal cascade, a body, rock skipped smooth, wisping away across never ending lake. Wow. And this one's the last one. Um, some of you maybe have traveled to the UP. Sorry, my cat is taking a leap from my desk. Um, uh, so this one is inspired by a UP trip. I did a, a trip around the lake. Um, I've done that twice actually since COVID started, um, two different directions around the lake. And this one is about being in sort of a very remote area. Um, and it reminded me a lot of my sister. This poem sort of is inspired by her travel lust, her wanderlust. Uh, disconnect, 1990s kegerator, dead zone, dirt road, light, gas gone on my own. Phenomenon to Quamanon, Michigan blue, berry beer, all hail the end of the road. And that's that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Katie. Uh, I love the word Tequamanan, the falls are there, beautiful. Um, there's a funny story in my family that my father was actually conceived there. My grandpa took great pride in telling my father that, <laughs> which is a hilarious thing. So can we give another round of applause for Katie? He would be mortified to realize that I said that publicly. Um, all right, let's move to the next group. We'll do some in-person readings and we'll go back to some online. Um, but Ariane. Right. Hello, everyone. Hello. I am so excited. Are you the feature, Lou? Yes, because she's a star. Oh my God. You guys are not ready. Um, 
I just want you guys to know that when the movie of Valerie is made and they uh -huh. talk about my sister, the first performance of it was at my house. So make sure you put that in the movie, yeah. okay? <laughs> just, I, just do that. Um, I am very excited to share that I get to host house shows now. It's been like a really big dream of mine. I just love creating this kind of environment, except for some, you know, some fun party things. And, you know, we get to just still do what we do here in a more home setting. So if you're interested in being on some guest list, please come talk to me. I'm very excited about that part. I, um, <clears throat> I'm here with my siblings. Shout out to my siblings, yes. Um, we've, had, uh, we've had a heavy uh, family weekend. Uh, we're commemorating some things and we're, uh, so um, my sister had a son um, a year ago. He um, had a heart condition. He passed away in the hospital 10 days. Um, yesterday was the day. Uh, and then, uh, you know, family doesn't, always decide to be easy <laughs> or loving. Uh, so we're just, um, we're struggling. And uh, the poem I wanna share is called Grown because, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna stop messing with this. Um, I always want to believe that there's enough work and enough vulnerability and enough I can do to be grown and to make sure that I can help my family and I can help us stay together and, and everything. And I keep learning the lesson over and over that um, it doesn't matter what I do, how much I do, um, everyone has to decide to do that growth as well. And uh, so we, uh, I think I wanna share this. I wanna talk about it. Yeah, yeah a little bit. You, you, want, you wanna talk about it? Okay, so I'm gonna give my sister this space. Oh, is that okay? That is shit. This is not. I'll do my poem after that. Okay, so uh, my sister has a wound on her hand. Uh, she, she and my mother fought, and uh, it's no, just. Okay, that sounds. That makes me feel. Like no, no, I was bad. Gonna like, give it, it's not your fault. Go ahead, you. Um, it's my sister Ashley. Yeah. Everyone's yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not really. Uh, stand up here and talking person. So just know I've definitely drank a little bit and I have a whole <laughs> lot of confidence right now. <laughs> um, who, so yes, so this weekend, as she said, was the one year passing of my son. Um, he was born with a heart condition. The right side of his heart just did not function at all. Um, during the surgery, surgery went well and after, you know, when they're doing heart surgery, obviously babies are on bypass during that. So they give a medicine that thins out the blood. So during trying to like reverse that, they gave him a medicine that created so many blood clots. They repeatedly gave him the medicine and created so many blood clots that went to his brain, liver, and kidneys. And after that, there was nothing that we could possibly do. So, this year has been just just day by day, day by day. Um, definitely developed a lot of habits. I don't want to, <laughs> but it was just coping. Um, so my relationship with my mother has never, ever been easy since I was around eight years old. I can remember I'm just, you know, in the bathroom, just trying to, you know, do my business. Eight years old, trying to do my business and she would call out my name and I would say, I'm in the bathroom. She did about two, three times. At that point, she opened the door and she grabbed my head, pulled it down and punched me in the back because I was being disrespectful, not coming when she was calling me. So it's, it's never ever been good. Like from there, you know, I've been kicked out, I don't know how many times, once was for wearing my earphones while doing the dishes as that was disrespectful to her. So it, it just continued. And I, we actually went, um, when I graduated 2016, I, she didn't come to my graduation. I've never had any type of celebration for myself. She didn't come to my graduation because she had 
ambassador is something outside of the, outside of the country. But you know, as my mother, that should be your first priority to come and celebrate your daughter. So she went there and when she did that, I ended up cutting contact with her completely for about three years. Um, I ended up returning because I'm gonna call you out. We, we, we went through some things and you know, I, I, at that point I didn't have any choice but to kind of return to my mom and um, she was emailing me all the time, calling me all the time. It, at that point, I had no thoughts. Easiest thing was to go back there. So I did. And that was 2019. From there, still a terrible relationship. Am I taking up too much time? Just call me. Yeah, you have some time. Okay. Um, it's still still a rough relationship. Um, I actually had another son in 2018 who passed from a miscarriage at 14 weeks and having to deliver him and everything. I actually ended up bearing both of them together. Um, she was not around when that happened. So going back and I got pregnant that year, at that in 2020, I was out of her house, but our relationship, you know, she was still helping me throughout everything I needed to do. Um, I got pregnant and the words that she told me when I told her was, why would you do this again? Moved past it, went through my pregnancy, the entire time because both of my sons had different fathers, she would tell me I was a whore, that I was being judged all the time because of what I've done as a woman, I guess. Um, so throughout the pregnancy as she would, I will not lie, throughout the pregnancy, she was great. I was working so much. I was not taking care of myself the way I should have been. She was there to give me meals every day. She was there to take me to work. She was there to take me to the appointments or give me the, her car if I need to go to the appointments. So at 20 weeks is when I found out he had a car condition. And for that, we had to travel repeatedly to and from Indy, Riley Children's Hospital to just get as much ultrasound work as we could possibly get. And she was there with me. I could only bring one person in at that time, no, nobody else was above, obviously, my mom. My mom, the one who birthed me. Obviously, I want her there. So she was with me through it all, through birth. I could only have one person. I chose her. Um, I had my son. Um, she stayed with me in Indy while he wasn't, he didn't get surgery until a week after he was born. So she stayed with me that entire week. And at some point, I remember her, I have no pictures with my son, none. But I have a thousand and one pictures of her with him. And I remember once I asked her to take a picture with me, a picture of us. And she told me, why would I? You won't let me hold him. So I said, okay. And I gave her, I gave him to her. And I sat down in the back, I sat on the phone messaging my siblings. And as I got up, just to go and just walk around and like get some fresh air, something like that. As I walked around, I went to go touch my son's head. She shoved me away and she said, that's why he's dying. You won't let him sleep. I lost it. I left the room. She texted me multiple times, Ashley, where are you? Because it had been hours after I left. Immediately went to go find a social worker and speak to them because what the fuck? Excuse my language, but what the fuck? I spoke with the social worker. They asked me repeatedly, do you want her to leave? Do you want us to get security and have her escorted out? I said, no, that's my mom, that's his grandmother. She has to be here for the surgery. She came back for the surgery. She had left for it just, just to come back here, saw things would work. So she came back for the surgery. And so she was there with me when um, everything happened. They did the surgery, they brought him back up to the room after they told me he had so many blood clots, but they had to keep him on um, the bypass machine, a little small one. Uh, they brought him up to the room. 
My mom took one look at him and she called the priest to come do his last rites. She just, for me, she jumped ahead. Didn't even give him a chance to try and heal, to fight. She jumped ahead. After everything, she was great in dealing with funeral service, all of that. So, yes, that leads us up to now. It's been one year. Yesterday, she planned a little, a little, little memorial for him. I love that. I thanked her because I was not able to. Mentally, financially, I was just not able to. She handled that. 1 p.m. we were supposed to be at the cemetery. I woke up 11 a.m. I knew what I had to do. I had steps in my head of what I had to do to get ready for him. The first thing she texted me that morning was, get up and come make these things for the reception. Irritated me. But again, she's my mother. I'm gonna do what she asks. So I went and made them. After that, I'm getting ready to go. She has been rushing me this whole time saying, you're running out of time, you're running out of time. This is about me today, right? It's about me and my son. I ignored that. I tried my best to work with her. I, um, as I'm getting ready, I have put some things aside for my hair because I, sorry, I hate doing my hair. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just in braids. So I had some head wraps set to the side. 10 minutes before we're supposed to leave, she grabs that pile, she tosses it in the washer. I had not cried the whole day, but that sent me over the edge. I started crying. She looked at me and she said, what's wrong with you? Calm down. It's not that serious. I, cu I cussed back at her. I said, it's not about the fucking head wrap. I hate today. Today is the, one of the worst days of my life. And she just, we're African, so you know, she did. <laughs> she had that and I just, I walked away. Right after that, I had already told her I was gonna go buy special flowers to take and bury for him. She immediately left, grabbed some flowers off of her storage, whatever that she's had for the past 15 years, just to go to be the first one to put them in the ground before I could put flowers for my own son. When I got there, I wanted to rip them out so bad. I said, no, that's my mother. I tied them together. I made a beautiful little presentation for him and we continued on. We move on to today. Today I woke up this morning and she told me to grab my things and get out. I said, okay, I'll have an argument. I started grabbing my things. My brother here, where we, we live together, he had some laundry at her house too. I started grab, grabbing that together too. She came in, she said, why are you grabbing that? I said, you just told me to grab my stuff and get out. I'm gonna take everything with me. We're just gonna go right back to Fort Wayne. She saw me doing that. She grabbed the basket. In that basket, I had put my youngest brother, his watch. She had got for his birthday on his 18th birthday last year. He wanted it resized for him to go to prom on Friday. He asked me to grab that for him so we could go get that resized. She saw me take that watch. She came back and yelled at me and she said, I cannot take that watch because I'm gonna go to the pawn shop and sell it. My mother. And then we continue on. I'm mad, I'm yelling, I grab my stuff, whatever. I start leaving. She locks the door on me, throws my stuff outside with some trash, locks the door. My brother's clothes are still inside. I got angry. I went through my, I went through my little brother's window, <laughs> grabbed, grabbed, grabbed my brother's stuff. She pushed me a few times, grabbed my brother's stuff, left. We came back trying to go back to Fort Wayne. She started fighting because there's a special, I understand, it's earphones, it's an AirPods. I understand it's a simple thing. 
But that simple thing is what I bought for myself because nobody else did the day that I pushed him out. That was my push gift. And I engraved it, Adiel's mommy. It was in her car. She refused to open the door just to unlock it. She refused. I lost it. I went inside and I stood there looking at her. She said, I'm gonna call the police. I said, please, didn't say no other words. She looked me straight in my eyes and she said, even if it was Adiel's heart, I would not give it to you. I saw red. I attacked her. I went after her and I said, why would you say that to me? The day after his one year, why would you say that to me? We began fighting. She bit me. A lot of police, a police was called. We now have a police report. And I, she actually got a protective order against me an hour after it happened. Realize I've been talking a lot. Um, I'll finish it up. Go ahead. Yep. <laughs> um, thank you guys for listening to me. And, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do my poem. It's okay. Um, I just want to say thank you guys for listening to all of that. Um, it honestly, as I'm sitting back, I feel like. I feel like that, like, I feel like it's a, a play that was written, like, that's so crazy, but that is just our daily, our regular life, so I do apologize because I don't, it wasn't either intention to kind of make the whole, you know, and we're going to keep going with more poetry, um, I'll do poetry at a different time, thank you guys so much. You know, when a uh... When we, I got started, we talked about radical community in a place where people can share and talk, and that is absolutely welcome. And I'm so sorry about the situation, and so honored that you feel safe enough in this space to be completely honest with all of us. That's a really special thing, and thank you. And please do not like in the back of the head the thought of like, so no, yeah, no, no, don't, but don't, but, but okay. Well, let's address that right now. Anyone concerned about losing an extra couple minutes? No. Look around. <laughs> look, look around. No one is concerned, so you don't have to worry about that either. Okay. All right? All right. One more round of applause for All right. All right. We are going to pivot now to Deb. Okay. Yeah. Deb. poem um, is going to be as applicable to some of the people in the audience because part of it may be because of my young age. So, um, <laughs> and if it isn't, that actually I think is really good. So um, we'll see here. Um, will the real me please rise? Step out from that layered disguise and lay down the scripts that have served you so well and find the story that is yours alone to tell. For most of my life, I have been far too content to allow parts of me to remain dormant. Defined by the roles I have played, I've been reluctant to be the one on center stage. The roles of daughter, sister, mother, and wife, I have allowed them to consume my life. I've used these roles as a protective fortress and in the process, they have become the thesaurus, try saying that fast, the thesaurus <laughs> for who I think I am. Well, because I have loved being all of them. I threw myself in willingly because they were everything I wanted to be. This is not a complaint. This is not a lament. I don't even have one regret. There are no tears for the way the years have been spent. But these roles were never meant to confine me. They are enhancements, not intended to define me. And it is not healthy for anyone, including me, to sit on the sidelines waiting for an opportunity or a circumstance where other people need me. Because no one, not even me, should live their life vicariously. Both of my parents have left this earth and I'm still their oldest daughter, their girl, for whatever that's worth. But there are no more lines on the page of that script. 
No more birthdays to try not to forget. What if my other roles were to evaporate and I were left to navigate a life where I am no longer sister, mother, or wife, just me, myself, and I? While I hope and pray that day never comes or arrives, I need to embrace this one life that is only mine. Investing in myself is not a selfish endeavor, nor is it an attempt to sever or tear asunder that which has been joined together. It is just time to resurrect that girl who used to think she could conquer the world. Emerging as a healthy version of me creates a healthier addition of we. All of my relationships benefit when in myself I invest. It is time to turn the page, allow me, myself, and I to take the stage, stepping out of the shadows and cultivate the field that has been fallow. No more lingering or hiding in the wings. I will recognize my hesitation as unfounded trepidation. I will begin by accepting invitations and entering unfamiliar situations, leaving behind my self-imposed detention. I will stifle my suspicions, revisit my intentions, silencing the voices that proclaim you don't belong in new domains. Will the real me please rise, embrace me, myself, and I. The sky is the limit. All I have to do is permit it. Wow. Can we give one more round of applause for that? Just a, a quick shout out to Deb as well. A few summers ago, I was a young person working in the community and also trying to write and I needed a place to stay and she and her husband Steve took me in for a summer. So she has someone write, so shout out. Um, all right, Tom, you ready to go? I see a couple of you know me, huh? <laughs> Good evening. I have uh, a few short poems. I don't write long ones. Uh, this one's called Another Good Climax. I had just finished a very good novel, which moved my emotions from one emotional state to another, like from fear to anger, to laughter, to sadness, to kindness, to hatred, to loneliness, to the need of a companion. And with all of that, the author stole my imagination. For I was captivated throughout the 365 pages of his fictional novel about two lovers who really didn't love each other at all. I remember the last lines of the novel. Kathy turns to him and says, you know, Jack, I am very fond of you. He smiles at her while he buckles his belt and slowly turns away from her for the last time. Without saying a word, he walks away. I like that writer. This is called being prepped for a catheterization. Does everyone know what that is? Everyone know what it is? Yes. All right. I stared up at the nurse in her blue uniform, but that's not what impressed me. It was her eyes, strikingly blue, beautiful, and soft, easy to look upon, and I studied them as she, as she told me. I could trust her. As she smiled at me, I felt comfortable in my position, though I had no choice in that I had to lay still while she shaved around my manhood. She talked about the raging fires out west. 
and and how they feel the atmosphere with smoke but did create beautiful sunsets for others in different states i listened but i was anxious because i kept thinking in hopefulness that she knew how to use that single edge stainless steel blade <laughs> This one's called a long-term relationship, a development of quietude. After 40 years of marriage, they sit at their kitchen table, each with their cell phone in hand, and look down at them. Neither gives eye contact to the other, but it does not matter this appearance of separateness because they are still in love and enjoy each other's company in peace and quiet until the toast was burnt. <laughs> I really like this one because I, I experienced this myself. The tone you assume. Don't be concerned about my tone in that last email. It was a mood, a passing moment, an electronic emotion. No worries, don't let it bother you because it was me being me in a nanosecond. Besides, that email was for someone else. <laughs> All right, one more. Oh, man. All right, I'll read this one. Um, this is called, it's hard to let go. So this is, we're gonna get serious now, right? Forever longing, love and hugs by a loved one or by a true friend who has passed away, but who is thought of every day from one's memories, by videos, by pictures, by stories told. Yet one wants to hold each one of them one more time to express love and or true friendship, which will never die as long as one is alive because it is too hard for one to let them go. Thank you. Another round of applause for Tom. Thank you. If we had more time, I'd like a full explanation of what a catheter is. I, you know, I mean, you live long enough, you probably yeah, <laughs> Thank you, truly, thank you. All right, all right, Wayne. All right, and because we want to make sure we stay on track, we're going to try to keep it about five minutes. Is that all right? Okay. Um, so my poem doesn't seem like it's too cut and dried, predetermined, and really doesn't fit in. I'm going to ask some questions first. Ted said he was looking for nuggets of wisdom when he comes to these things. I'm looking for something. I'm looking for someone who has never hurt another person. Yeah. Someone who has never done anything wrong. Someone who has no regrets. Okay, I'll do the poem. <laughs> A couple of years ago when this book came out, I gave it to one of my friends. And about half a year later, he called me and said, Wayne, it's really good. I finally finished it. You know, it took me a long time because I had to have a dictionary next to me while I was reading your book. <laughs> there is one word that I'm going to explain before I get into this. Dross, D-R-O-S-S. Dross -S. means something that's useless, needs to be thrown away. They even use it in um, making metal. You, you get this molten metal boiling. The impurities come to the top. That's the dross. Finding my name. If you would know just who I am, then you must come to understand I see myself as Jesus' friend, 
the one he brought back from the dead, and that perhaps my name is Lazarus. <laughs> Lazarus. When Jesus learns a certain man is sick, he does not go, but waits for two more days and tells his friends, our Lazarus is dead. But yet I say God's glory, you shall see. Commands he them to take away the stone. They give reply, our Lazarus does stink. Ignoring nature's law, he thunders out, now, Lazarus, come forth. And it was so. E'en so today, I come to him and wait bound hand and foot with filthy rags of sin at his command come forth and show to all how thou art cleansed i tremble and complain oh no they must not see my dirt and dross says he you have the glory of my cross Uh, I'm going to pull the room in the same kind of way you were. Can we raise of hands of people who will be willing to give Wayne a round of applause? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Truly. All right, we're going to turn to some of our uh, Zoom viewers, Tanya and Dan. And if they're still up, is that still? Uh, not Dan, but not Tanya. Dan, but There's Tanya. Tanya. And word on the street is, from what I've been told, this is the first time at the Poetry Den or at any poetry reading? Oh, for myself, um, I I am a literature teacher, and um, I've been I've written poetry since I was a kid, and I'm just thrilled to find this group. You guys are so talented and so clever. So right. um, it was Ted who uh, introduced me. I wish I were there in person just to feel this energy because you guys have it. You have all kinds of wonderful things. Um, the, I'll just read a couple here and. Um, Today, a new rule for the poem. Today, a new rule for the poem. It does not have to be about anything. It does not have to be understood like the introspective layers of cabbage leaves concealing enigmas inside core after core of metaphor. Today, it can begin with breath, nourishing thought, however humble, or it can eloquently rumble in clouds whose swell and smell tell of rain which is not yet rain. That's one. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You guys are so warm and just so welcoming and loving and um, emotion recalled in tranquility, right? <laughs> okay, this one, I have a poem about fall and here's my attempt at a, a, a picture of a leaf there. It's called A Leaf Speaks. When will we be at peace with the process of decay? We rake the orange leaves and bag the bright leaves and throw them all away. <laughs> I think that speaks to our culture's relationship with, thank you, um, with, with death. And um, uh, I'm very multicultural and um, um, we don't like death. It's all sanitary and scrubbed away and in a hospital. And um, um, my husband passed away a year and a half ago. And I may finish the poem I wrote for him um, called Gethsemane. Um, and the only line I, I remember now is that a stranger um, without a face handed me a plastic bag of his belongings. And that's what it felt like. Um, but I'm not dwelling on that, but so I appreciate hearing um, our stories that make us human. Um, so, so I'm glad to find this group because I want to um, allow poetry to heal me. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You're, I'm coming next time, I swear, and I'll bring cookies. Do you guys do cookies? Snaps if you want cookies? <laughs> okay, my, um, my last one, um, again, kind of a picture. 
it's a crescent moon. I love the moon. And I think we're all romantic, right? Don't we love nature and the moon? And, yeah. and, and we like our silence. And I, I like that poem uh, that, that spoke of how this silence is so important because poets watch. We're all ears and eyes and we observe. Okay, so this is crescent. Half lit in the dark, dark night, your twin curves turn wheels spoked with stars. But when you are gone, moon, the night is stale and long, and crickets pine away their emptiness. The end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I'll keep watching. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya. Can we give a round of applause for a teacher and for a poet? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, all right. We are wrapping up the, the list. Um, Arnaud, the time for us to start with. Um, um, my older sister, you know her. She's a poet, and she inspired me to write this the other day. Okay. Okay. It's the first time I've heard it. Oh, that's it. My tree grows. It knows knowledge to the edge of every branch. My tree yearns. It learns sweeping its shade amongst the brave. My tree towers. Its hours filled with drinking droplets of wisdom and performing miracles. My tree is not hollow. Allow its bark to protect what lies beneath a fruit so spiritual. My tree's roots dig deep, big, and reaching even past foreign waters until it meets familiar, my bad, reaching even past foreign soil until it meets familiar waters. Finally, when my tree falls, the seeds and sap have thrived, allowing the bark to become immortal in the walls of the house I've built. Wow. And I have one more short one. I wrote a while ago, I don't remember it, but uh, it's on my Instagram, so I just, I thought I'd say it too. So much glory, the irony lies in the gold. Every morning, the ivory unfolds, seeking ebony to uphold. At either, it's, at either the lowest or highest regards, only eyes for the one strongest in the arts, strongest or in the arts. I stand to disregard every opposition against colors. As art is my form, I was woke long before I removed the covers. I love the pause before the second applause. It's kind of nice. Let me give a round of applause for her. All right, there is a, a, a real uh, pervasive case of if you sit in these seats long enough, you start writing poetry. I've seen it happen many, many times. So those people who are visiting who don't consider themselves poets, right? Oh, I only write a little bit. I'm not a poet. Just be forewarned, it is contagious. Um, so now the last person we have on the list before we go to our feature is, one of the, is the founder of this space and one of the main reasons why it is a space that is so warm and welcoming and filled with such great art. Can I welcome Poetic Melody? Uh, so, I just want you all to give Spencer a round of applause. I think I said to uh, Spencer last year that um, I was really looking for someone uh, that could come alongside me and just, you know, like, like just give me just a little bit of break just to be able to enjoy. Um, well, I'm rolling up on a decade of doing this. And in the beginning, like I was running cameras and, and I was looking at the list and I was doing music and I just felt like, you know, I never really got to hear um, the poets that came until I listened to it or whatever. <clears throat> and so Spence said he would help me out. And even today I was just like, what do you need? You mean do music? You need? He's like, I thought you just wanted to come and <laughs> and so I said, uh, yeah, you're right. So that was a great like reminder of um, what I asked, because when you do something so long, you just kind of, you know, stay in that mode. And a shout out to all of you all that do these things. Lulu and um, <clears throat> I wanted to share this. Uh, first, I want to say to Tom, uh, I'm glad that he's back in the house with us. Um, 
His son used to come to the poetry den a lot uh, before he passed, and he's the one that brought him. And um, Sean was like, he was a great, he was just a great guy. Like we all thought he was weird when he came in because he had these like he was like these poems were like, what is he talking about? Uh, and as he kept coming, we kept having that relationship and and it was just great. And so we miss him all the time. I, I still got his painting in my in my house. And so I'm glad that the spirit of him is living through you and doing this poetry. So <clears throat> I'm actually going to read this piece that my my son is not a poet, um, but he's listened to all of my poems. I've made him <laughs> read them um, <laughs> as well as anybody that's close to me. And uh, so he wrote this first poem, and I always say that. Oops, I always say that when my how I started poetry was through pain, and this was Langston's. Uh, my son's name was Langston. He was named after Langston Hughes, uh, and he wrote this poem after um, losing a child. Him, him, and his wife. They were pregnant, and she was 13 or 14 weeks along, and they lost a baby, and um back in December but he you know that, that pain keeps going and so one day uh the backdrop to this is one day it was flurries he's living in Atlanta um one day it was flurries out and he wrote this poem snowflakes fall from the sky so beautiful and fragile so intricate and detailed so beautiful snowflakes they bring us so much joy a sign of changing seasons a change that brings death before life, leading the way for spring to, to bring anew. So beautiful snowflakes are elusive, fragile to the touch. Something so beautiful, only to be witnessed for a moment, a moment in awe and amazement. So beautiful, God will create something so extraordinarily beautiful and yet so temporary that in your hands, will melt and disappear, leaving nothing but a puddle, a puddle of what was and what could have been, a memory of how beautiful and complex it was, witnessing its life, its beauty and death, such a blessing. Although gone, its beauty will remain my snowflake. <clears throat> And then I'll just do one more. What time is it? No, I'm going to call it a quit. Yeah, I'm going to leave it with that because we got a wonderful feature here and I'm looking forward to hearing from that. And I value your time here. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Spencer, too. Can we give a wonderful round of applause? All right. Uh, if you will permit me, these are the kind of the uh, flexibilities you get from hosting. I actually wrote a poem this morning. It's very short. And I was wondering if I could share that really quick before we hand it off. Is that all right? Oh, no? Oh, no? All right. It's called This Old Woman Waits. This old woman waits, gnarled hands clasped before her, one loosely wrapped around the other like the folds of a rose. She stands shy and silent in her thin blue sweater, still unseen by the pharmacist. Wait, swaying to one foot and then the other like a tree in the breeze. She seems nervous, unassuming, awkward, and modest. She stands like one awaiting the judgment of death itself and not wanting to draw attention to her concern. She seems like Orpheus in Hades, the second after the completion of his keen. She waits like a bride just before her wedding night, embarrassed slightly for her eagerness. She need not be. Friends, it is my distinct honor to introduce to you the feature poet, Lulu Moyo. Lulu Moyo is a slam and spoken word artist. Using her current academic career at the University of Notre Dame, Lulu works to explore her passion of community engagement, advocacy, decolonizing the classroom and curriculum, and African dias diasporic achievement. Yeah, all right, we can snap for that. We can snap for that. <laughs> 
As a Zimbabwean immigrant, it is important to her to use her platform to dispel negative and inaccurate tropes about Africa and African cultures. As a nationally and internationally competitive slam poet, internationally, you heard that correctly, <laughs> and, and a visual artist. Listen, listen. The trick is you act like I wrote it. That's like, yeah, like I wrote it. Oh, Spence, all those nice things about me, thanks. Lulu, and visual artist Lulu has also utilized art as a vehicle for education and social change. She has had works published in newspapers and academic journals, such as the Journal of Progressive Human Services. As a longtime youth worker, Lulu has facilitated writing and performance workshops in elementary, middle school, and high school students in different parts of New England, and focusing on art as a means of social justice. She also has run art expression workshops in South Africa and Namibia. Uh, oh, hold up, Namibia. Na Na Namibia. I have it. I have the pronunciation. I did my research. Namib <laughs> there's, there's parentheses right there. I did. I did. I did check. N Namibia. No, yours was wrong actually. <laughs> Sorry to say. It came with parentheses. I'm like, I don't think that's right. Yeah, Namibia. <laughs> Sorry to call you out like that. <laughs> Her socially conscious writing style encompasses a longing for her home culture, as well as a deep love letter to the diaspora. Can you give a Riley round of applause? translation, better yet a revelation, but not quite yet a revolution talk. A woman at the corner store speaking in the comfortable rhythm of her language, the broken beat smooth and raspy vibe, a bilingual interlude, interrupted by the cocky confusion of a Caucasian. <laughs> if you don't speak English, you better go back to whatever jungle you call that of sister. It's the kind of chatter that does not leave your ear, that crawls up your spine and gnaws at your limbs, a paralyzing, immobilizing noise that leaves you brandish, uh, leaves a brandish mark on your soul, leaves you tang at your frayed flesh and able to remove its staple. I am not your sister. Mm. Pale-skinned ignorance with veins black as hate that spews from your pursed mouths. If only you knew what I know, what worlds I've seen, lives lived, what is misunderstood, mocked and mimicked through crisscross stairs of those words. Their cleverly placed syllables, a bilingual paradise, a sort of lost in translation type of clarity and serenity that moves past the tongue and escapes to the lips talk. A sort of talk you fail to think I understand, me with my polished and prim syllables of choreographed phrases and ample body statements in those hollow socketed eyes of yours. You see me as some skinny, well read, well spoken, wordly worded white girl trapped inside the frame of a full thick, big hat, thick haired, nappy headed, thick skinned Negro that stands in front of you, never missing the beat, the brutal beat that knocks against my skull till it finds their way in. You let your venomous fang sink into me, letting you, your. <laughs> To say, sorry, my mom is in the back and it's like, <laughs> let me, you're like, your poison disabled me like a lion that is a stash and wounded unsuspecting prey, but you see, I'm not so naive as some wild game to be preyed upon because I am the well-spoken, wordly worded me laced with pronounced hips and African mahogany skin. You think that I do not understand this chit chat, the busy speak that parallels what I am from because I do not back my words with a beautifully arrayed tonality. You assume that I must not know where I come from. My history and culture love lost in the blurs of America, that all I should ever be mindful of is my cotton picking, slave ship to silence, African ancestors. That is the white noise you hear when my mouth opens and dribbles out words. You pompously ponder me when I state my true nationality, one reminiscent of my profound Indivella skies that pull at my choked heart strings. It's not a game of picking tongues where you scoff and net from us our humanity and our humility, where you simple-minded simpletons use every fiber of your racially closet beings to be unaccepting, unrelenting, undisifiably skewed. You side say do not see that it is simply the simple talk that gets us through. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry, so my mom is here, which is amazing, but see, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she's seen me perform since maybe high school, and it's like her shock is scaring me. I'm like, maybe. <laughs> 
Um, but thank you for the warm welcome. My name is Lula, Lulu Moyo, Lulama. Uh, I'm originally from Zimbabwe, but I've lived a little bit of everywhere, including Maine. A lot of my narratives come from my experiences growing up um, in the, let's say kindly, uh, culturally uh, depraved, <laughs> maybe um, an environment where I was pr probably the only person of color in my whole school district and town for several years. And so many of my narratives, including this piece, which I wrote when I was 15, um, have been the pieces that I've carried with me around my experience. And so I really feel honored uh, to be able to share my writings as uh, a Zimbabwean immigrant, as a queer Black person in the world, as a young person, as an academic, as, a, as an artist. I am really honored that you felt that you could share your piece and your whole family is here holding space for you. Um, I think it really touched me as well as complicated relationships with African uh, parents. It's very tough and common. Um, and that was not subtext, by the way, but <laughs> just like <laughs> appreciating that relationships are tough. Um, <laughs> but, but I think that it's wonderful that we can all show up with our different um, paths, our journeys, our baggage, our, our invitations to the table and, and can hold space together. Um, so I'm going to share some poems. Um, do I still have the same amount of time? Or OK, great. <clears throat> this piece is called, sorry, it's the change in weather. So I'm, I have a raspy voice, but it's raspy today. So. <laughs> Please bear with me. <laughs> uh, this is called, I Speak, You Speak. You speak such good English. What they really mean to say is, you speak such good English for an African. Raised eyebrows and snaring stares. How dare I speak clearly, eloquently, without falter, without the background rhythm of my roots. How dare I call myself an African, expecting headdresses and orange red cloth draping from my frame. You speak such good English for an African. You must have been privileged up, pri privileged growing up. Good for you. Because my speech isn't hesitant, unsure of your Latin-based conundrums, I must have been privileged. To have had the chance to uh, grow up in a mainly white society surrounded by suburban cul-de-sacs and PTA moms, I must have been privileged. To have attended schools where my face was the only face of color, where I was the only different one, when all I wanted to be was the same. Privileged to feel inadequate and strange that being born of a different country, being born of a different race was unacceptable. Good for me, huh? You speak such good English for an African, but are you really an African? An, an authentic African? The very blood that runs through my veins is the blood of my ancestors. The heart that beats in my chest rises to the same beat as theirs. What you want to hear is that I was born near a lion's den raised in the rural areas with the Bushmen, overcoming unimaginable struggles from a poor family that barely managed to put food on the table, being entertained by the sparks of a fire, watching the crackle and glow and dissipate into the night sky. Some of that is true, but it is not my Africa. My Africa is my grandmother's house at the end of a dusty dirt road. It's robin's egg blue paint chipping and faded around the edges. The warm afternoon air thick with the smell of ripening mangoes hanging from her garden, ready to be picked. The slippery feeling of the freshly waxed floors cool under my worn feet. The abundant laughter all around me. Small children on the floor pulling at Kulu to tell them another story, trying to push past the memories of pain that once harbored there, of illness and of death. The images of family I only knew for the beginning part of my life and got to know me towards the sudden end of theirs. I bet you don't know my Africa. You speak such good English for an African. Where's your accent? Where is my accent? <laughs> One of stylistic undertones of tongue clicks and the in-between confusion of a bilingual. I am sorry that I do not sound uh, more clearly palatable for you, plucked straight from the underbelly of my land, skin still marked by the auburn topsoils that move over my earth, eyes brazen and fatigued by the ominous journey I must have endured, a journey that must have been fueled by genocide or war. Maybe my family was fighting for a better life, yearning to hold the American dream tightly in their palms, leaving our culture behind. Yes, I speak good English for an African, especially for an African, so that my voice can be heard too, not pushed aside and disregarded, not laughed at or mimicked through crisscross stairs and go back to your own country. 
The words of my grandfather's grandfather's grandfathers are mine too. You'll hear my words of well-spoken English. You'll grasp onto every syllable and phrase in my well-spoken English because yes, I do speak English, good English for an African. Yes. <laughs> so I think Pam said this at um, the open mic that I was hosting very recently, that doesn't matter how many times you get up on the mic, I'm still like shaking like a leaf. So I'm glad that there's this podium right now. <laughs> this is like my coming out of retirement open mic also. <laughs> um, so as you can see, those first two pieces um, were pieces inspired by real conversations that I actually had. And so, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, real conversations that I actually had. So repeatedly people telling me that I trying to erase my culture from me because I do not sound like the image of Africans in Afri Africa that they have imagined uh, or Disney has developed for them. Um, and so um, the first piece actually was a conversation with my mom after she got off the phone with a telemarketer who just kept saying, what, what, what? And if you come from a diasporic culture, you often have to be the interpreter to people who do not understand your parents, guardians, siblings' uh, accents, and it infuriates me um, because it uh, takes away a person's dignity to have to talk through somebody else. Um, and so I often write about um, things that have actually happened to me, um, but this next piece is a piece inspired by um, an auntie who's uh, a very good family friend, but um, was experiencing a lot of really uh, trauma by uh, being forced into uh, sex work by her partner at the time. I know a whole lot more about what freedom isn't than what it is, because I've never been free. Asada Shakur. They told me I was beautiful an incandescent covering of gold-colored horizon, an untamed mane of brown curls and waves, a descendant of the Khoisan, a colored girl, my father's prized possession, the envy of every woman in my family. They told me I was beautiful. Men, they told me with flowers and jewels, they told me with late night phone calls, they told me with black eyes and broken ribs. I was their desert cat a woman of Africa, feral, uninhabited, blackened by the midnight in which they thought I danced, moonlight in their liquor swelled eyes. I was mysteriously alluring. They told me on the street corners where they forced me to work in the back seats of their wives' minivans and hostels and junkie motels. They told me by using my womb as their punching bag, by dirtying and defiling me, by taking the dance of my voluminous hips and the friendliness of my smile, they felt entitled to me. That this beauty belonged to them that these lips, legs, and breasts were theirs, not my childhood stories of climbing mango trees that my parents were home, not my laugh, my dreams, or the quiet sadness of my eyes, not the children they gave me to raise alone, the hurt and confusion that lines their small faces when they ask me about their father, when they ask me why their brother lives with another family now. They told me I was beautiful, but I became society's leper, a disgrace, disgusting, dangerous, a presumed drug addict, a loose woman of the night, a neglectful mother, just another black abusing welfare, just like a butcher with a meat cleaver, they dismembered me from feet to consciousness till I was left with nothing but a bare-boned hollowness. They told me I was beautiful. And now I will never feel safe in the presence of another man, never know what it's like to trust irrevocably to give somebody as much as they take. I will never feel the closeness of someone imprinting themselves on my soul, just those who leave etch marks in my skin. Most of all, I will never tell myself that I am beautiful because I won't believe it. But I thank you because I may be broken, but I am not finished yet. 
I know that I will never need affirmation from anyone other than myself, my forgiveness, my willingness to heal. I will return to the sacredness of my own divinity because like sweet Asada also says, I believe that a lost ship steered by tired seasick sailors can still be guided home to port. She is beautiful. Yeah, I think it's really fitting that it's raining because I feel um, really at peace when there's this like new energy that's able to come when the rain comes in. And so it's helping grieve, it's helping to birth, it's helping to wash and purify. And I feel like it's also just such a blessing for spaces like this um, where we can um, hold each other and, and honor each other and get ready for Monday. Um, and so the go, I hope you all go with the rain as a blessing. Um, so very few of my pieces are light, so I apologize uh, in advance that you may leave here with some cracks, um, but I think it's all worthwhile, um, I hope. Um, and so moving right along in that sad theme, um, this is a poem uh, dedicated to all my brown girls who have faced trauma, particular type of trauma. Um, brown girl, brown body. Brown girl, brown body. I brought it to the roof of my mouth, then to the sides, making it moist enough to chew. It had been in my school bag for a couple of months, probably leftover trade from math class or something. Gum was as good enough as money in grade school. The elastic bounce between my molars, then clicking, smacking in my ears. I chewed the gum into a puff. I chewed the gum into putty as I started to stare at the egg stucco ceiling. I tried to paint the ridges into a picture, connect the dots, make them a window out of the room. It was a beautiful May day, and I wanted to smell the ocean. Red, big red, that was my favorite gum. I wrapped the mush around my tip of my tongue the, to feel the fire burn into my taste buds, sharp and sweet. I let it burn. I let it burn until there was nothing but numb. I was gone. Wings sprouted from my back. I was a bird and I flew out of my window down to the harbor. I perched on the ocean salted rocks, letting the sun wet my feathers or warm my feathers. I am wet. My palms, I am pushed back into the stuffy apartment that smells of overcooked potatoes and onions. My hands are bloody where my fists clenched too tight. Gone is the numbing. Gone is the taste of cinnamon and fire from the gum I was chewing on my way home. There is blood in my palms. My eyes are swollen from the tears that refuse to fall. My throat is closed, no longer able to speak. My body has deserted me. It's still sitting on the rocks, feeling the suns and the ocean spray. My window is gone, caked over with stucco. I'm forced to look him in the eyes. Sorry, oh, this poem gets me. As he finishes taking me, brown girl, brown body, brown girl, brown body. They say one in five women are sexually assaulted, but it feels like our stats forgot about found girls. You see, the numbers feel a whole lot smaller when each of your friends, your brown sisters, and you have been taken. Brown girls with brown bodies made derelict. I am done. He spits out as he removes himself from my body, wipes himself clean, and heads to the bathroom. Don't forget to leave. Don't forget to lock when you leave. I walk home barefoot, not caring about the broken glass or cigarette butts. I step into the bathroom, undressed without turning on the lights, examine the parts of me that feel foreign, no longer mine. Unfamiliar and strange is the image of my own reflection. Like a ghost, like a ghost. But I am not afraid. I step into the shower. The ravines that ripple down my back are soothing. It's a bath. It's a baptism, ridding me of the dirt that festers. My body has returned, and 
I can cry again. This poem is for all the women who dare to feel intimacy and love, the girl who has just been kind, who woke up to smile at the sun, those who only meet violence. This poem is for the brown girl who was faulted for having a brown body. So I said, um, I'm from Zimbabwe. Um, I also said that I am here embodying my queer African fabulousness. Um, and I think one important thing that poetry does is illuminate narratives that um, don't get told often. And so we are able with our storytelling to make visible the hidden. Um, do I still have time? Okay. Um, so this is uh, a poem uh, about a woman in South Africa. This is uh, inspired by her story that she wasn't able to live out. To be a crown crane. They took a machete to Zanele's throat. The blade silencing her screams as it slashed the, noted vocal, the knotted vocal cords. They threw her head in the gutter where dogs go to piss. They cut her abdomen and let her insides fall into the street, blood cooling into thickened ravines in the sand. The same streets her little brother and sister will use to walk to school, right around the corner from where her mother sets up a stand to sell bread to make money for Zanele to go to school. The pelvis down was never found. Before they turned her into flies and maggots, another story never told, a body that could not even have a proper burial. She looked her assailants in the eyes and said, I know you. The shopkeeper from across the street of my house, my uncle, my uncle's friend, my brother, I know you. Women like us make you feel small. If we wear ourselves in public, we somehow threaten your existence. If our gay is shining too brightly, you are driven to quell it with tar and grit. You penetrate us because you think your appendage can undo the bindings of our souls. My queer is not crime. It does not leave our history and culture threadbare, exposed or exploited. You are killing me for the way that I love. The way that I love. I know you, dust in forgotten corners, mold that festers, a poison, you will always be small, but I am free, I am a bird. Being queer is stamped an African, a plague to culture, heritage. What is un-African is the colonially packaged homophobia, that foreign, in foreign infection that spreads across the cerebral. It stains neighbors, friends, families with vilified marks. It is the platform that wills people to forget their own humanity, theirs and others. It clips wings and creates corrugated iron cages. Some women are murdered. Some women are killed and forced to relive their deaths every day. The corrective rapes, the torture, the humiliation. Some women are even told, after all we're going to do with you, you are going to be a real woman and you're never going to act like this again. Let us be birds. Wow. All right, so I have two more poems for you all. Thank you for being such a, a, a lovely audience. Um, and they're happier, That's, uh, so I gotta bring it, I do, I do bring it full circle, to give you some, some brief, some brief, <laughs> um, brief joy. Uh, so this is a poem that I wrote for Juneteenth, um, the Juneteenth celebration. I was invited to um, speak during a dinner, um, although as my friend comrade uh, shared that not all of our poems are applicable to every situation, I think we can all share in the joy of what this uh, poem symbolizes. Did you know that this is a radical act? This right here, all of us, this honey fermented dark mahogany, brown sugar black, that shea butter, coconut oil, sweet tea, and sometimes coffee black. Oh. 
We are vibrating on the same wavelengths of love and affirmation. We are here to remind ourselves we are whole, connected by this gift, connected by this gift, connected by this gift wow. of life. But as radical as our embraced existence in this room is, so as our drive for it to be everything we were never told we could be. Life-giving rain, the North Star that points home, we are the deepest kind of magic. But as much as we are belonging to ourselves and our own divinity, we belong to each other. I am because you are. It is our conviction to work for each other, lift and be lifted. Our freedom isn't cultivated by one, but blood, but isn't cultivated by one, but the blood, sweat, bone of many. We move systems just as easily as we learn to move mountains. We continue to exist in times of violence where we are made to feel like cursed bodies disposed, where it's hard to to feel our beauty and our sacredness, but we must raise and resist, but it starts on days like this. We all come together and break bread. We are here, after all, the first fruit of the harvest, the fruit that gets the most sun, that rises and blooms, that spreads, that is the most sweet, that is the blessed and most sacred, the, brute that, the fruit that connects our past to our forever future. Wow. Wow. All right. So has anybody ever had an epic love that they still think about? No. no. OK. okay. <laughs> well, I mean, you still got time. You still got time. You still got time. Um, even if it's with yourself. Even if it's with yourself. <laughs> um, <laughs> tough crowd, tough crowd. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I hope you, I hope this poem inspires um, you like it did for me. So this is the only love poem I've ever written. Um, and so I'll leave it with that. Um, it's not to say that I've never experienced love outside of this person, but it was the most beautifully inspired form of love I felt. Ode to a one-time lover. When I kiss you, Mm. When I kiss you, it's like Harlem in the summertime. It's heavy air thickened with the scent of Caribbean and soul food, sweet caramelized plantains, oxtail curry goat, cornbread okra stew. It's bachata and salsa dancing in the park, hibiscus skylines and goldenrod ridges. It's waiting in the afternoon sun, orange and gold blanketing the neck bone of your dark mahogany, making me cherish the serendipity of our fingertips laced as we're still strangers. It's your train rides down, your, it's your, it's train rides, your M downtown, but you always taking the L uptown to my place. Yeah. The hours in quiet subway cars, trading shy smiles for more comfortable confession, the blur of the passing city outside when I kiss you. It's like jazz on Frederick Douglass Avenue, one in the morning, soft, heavy, drawing me up and sideways. It's electric guitar and saxophone sexy. It is unbearably real and vulnerable. It is technicolor, neon, street sound, resound, Basquiat, Badu, Kihende Wiley. It is poetry slams and strong, strong cups of coffee. We sip, we slip. When I kiss you, I'm saying, when I kiss you, I feel home. My mind is open to the still stain of calm and light. You are my Harlem in the summertime, and I am a traveler wrapped up in the gift and the memory of your lips. Thank you. Friends, can we give Lulu another round of applause? Yeah. 
All right, y'all. We have a couple order of business and we're going to be out of here, all right? First thing, it, this is kind of just a businessy thing. Um, we do record these things and it's a very vulnerable space and we get that and we want to honor that. So if you don't want this published, come talk to me, come talk to George, and we will make sure that happens. It does not, it was not published. We want to respect people's space and guard and honor what the space is. And if we need to do that, we will. That's the only businessy thing. The second thing is, uh, I want to send us off with a little blessing. Uh, now, in some religious traditions, it's customary to say, go in peace. Um, but there was a poet named Padraig Otuma who tweaked that a little bit. And I think this is very, very appropriate for what we've experienced here. For we have laughed and we have cried. We have opened ourselves up and we have opened ourselves up to others, right? And so, having done so, hear this and receive it. The task is ended. Go in pieces. Belief has been rear-ended, certainty amended, and found we found things needing mending that we didn't know was torn. The task is ended. Go in pieces to touch and heal your world. Wow. Let me leave with this last word. There's a teacher I have that I really love, and we do all these class periods and we go through really deep things, and he says to us every single time, hey, before you go, be gentle with yourself. We are encountering a lot in this class, so go home and be gentle with yourself. And I want to encourage that to you all as well. We have sat with a lot today. We have laughed a lot today. We have cried a lot today. So go and be gentle with yourself. All right. All right, and we're signing off. Have a good time.